Hey everyone, today I thought I'd tell you one of my all-time favorite stories about one of my all-time favorite people, Lady Jane Grey. She's back there in this painting, not sure if you can see it or if I'm even pointing to it, but I'll put it up on the screen. This is one of my heroes, one of my inspirations, and someone that I find their story to be so very encouraging that every day I just, I look up at that painting and I remember her story and I'm inspired and motivated to be as strong as she was. So I hope that you find the same in her story as well. Lady Jane was one of the youngest and most short-lived queens in all of England's history. She was 15 years old and she only ruled for nine days, which is just astounding. We need to remember her youth when considering the entirety of the story because it makes it that much more impressive. Now, she ruled from July 10th to July 19th in 1553, directly after her cousin Edward VI died, and she wasn't even in line for the throne. So how did she get here? Well, she was a part of the royal family, and when she was really young, she was sent away to live with some extended family. They raised her Protestant, but they also taught her so many things like uh, different languages. She knew Hebrew and Greek and Italian and Latin. She could read and write at a really young age. She was personable and kind and gentle. The people loved Lady Jane Grey. Now think about it. Now, even in America, we know the royal story pretty well, right? The ins and outs of it. It's on our entertainment media. It's on the news. We see it all over the place. We know the royal family. The same was true in England and Europe at this time. The crown was kind of a big deal. And so even though this person wasn't in line for the throne, she was a part of the royal family and she was known in England and dearly, dearly loved. But like I said, she was also Protestant. Now, at this time, England was Protestant. Edward VI, who was dying, was one of the first Protestant kings and one of the first Protestant regimes. So he actually instituted the first um, Protestant Archbishop of Canterbury, which is a huge deal. But he was dying of measles and of tuberculosis. And so he and his advisors and his the rest of his family had this plan to maintain the Protestantism of the crown by putting a Protestant person on the throne. Even though it was his half-sister, Queen Mary, who should have ascended, Edward signed something in the night saying that Lady Jane Grey should take his place and any of her male heirs after her, delegitimizing Queen Mary and actually bringing all the prominence to Lady Jane Grey, who was not in line for the throne at all. They were first cousins once removed. So, she had a ways and a lot of people had to die before she was ever in line for that throne. And yet this was the plan to maintain Protestantism because Queen Mary was very staunchly Catholic and had planned to take the whole rest of the nation back into Catholicism. So this is what happened. And Lady Jane finds herself in the middle of this plot that she's barely aware of, let alone party to. She is actually quoting, quoted as having said, the crown is not my right. It pleases me not. Mary is the rightful heir. Now consider this, she says this, when if Mary ascended to the throne and was against Protestantism, Lady Jane and her family would either be killed or exiled. That's what was going to happen. And yet she didn't see herself as the queen. This wasn't right and she knew it wasn't right. And so she tried to oppose it as best she could. Actually, when she found out that she was being crowned queen at the Tower of London, she fainted at the news of what was happening. So she was not party to this and only, I mean, she had to acquiesce enough to like stand there as they placed a crown on her head, but this was not her plan at all. And yet she finds herself right in the middle of it because her dad and uncle had this idea and they influenced Edward VI, who was also a very young king, to ascend or to uh, allow Lady Jane to ascend to the throne. Now, this didn't last very long. Even though the people of England loved her, they did not see this as a legitimate transfer of power. And so they backed Queen Mary fully, including the army. So Queen Mary rushes in after nine days of queenship for Lady Jane. She takes the throne back. She imprisons all of her, all the rebels, all the people that are against her. And she brings the nation back into a state of solidarity behind her. So now Lady Jane, after nine days at 15 years old, is imprisoned in the Tower of London along with her father. And so what's going to happen? This is insane. So Mary, even though she is, she is Bloody Mary for a reason, she was very, very staunchly against Protestantism. This was her family, and it doesn't always bode well to kill your family, even if they are rebellious. And so she allowed Lady Jane's father to be released from prison for a time. 
she didn't see him as like the kingpin or the mastermind. She saw him as kind of harmless. And so she released him. She kept Mary there, hoping that she could turn her to Catholicism if she just put the right teachers in front of her. She's a young person. She figured, you know, she probably barely knows what she believes. I'll just send in some of my best um, ministers and then they will bring her into Catholicism. So we won't have to have some big dramatic thing where we put her to death. But Lady Jane's stupid father went and rose up a tiny, tiny rebellion with barely anybody enough to remotely even take the crown back and rose up against Queen Mary again. Well, Queen Mary's patience had been tested, and so she immediately put down the rebellion and put Lady Jane's father to death, which also sentenced Lady Jane to death because now it's shown that this family can't be trusted. And so her patience is out. Lady Jane is sentenced to die. But before she dies, the confessor to the queen, who is known as John Feckenham, he asks if he can go and speak with her to at least, in his mind, save her soul. If he can't save her as a person, could he at least go and try and save her soul, bring her back to Catholicism, back under the auspices of the church? Now, this John Feckenham was a really interesting guy. He was loved by Henry VIII, but then later, when Protestantism kind of came to power, he was imprisoned by the Archbishop of Canterbury, that same first Protestant one that Edward VI put in power. Now, eventually, he was removed from prison to take place in these debates between Catholics and Protestants. And they thought, well, this guy, he's in prison. We can easily delegitimize him. We'll bring him against some of our best Protestant uh, debaters, and we'll show the people just how wonderful our faith is and how lowly and nothing their faith is. But this didn't really work because... John Feckenham was very intelligent, but he was also a man of the people. He was a meek and gentle person that was known for his philanthropy and his giving. And so people loved him and he presented his his beliefs very, very well. And so when Mary rises to power, she releases John Feckenham from prison, from the Tower of London, and he becomes her personal confessor. And even though he's, he's very strongly Catholic, He uses his influence with the queen to constantly try and reduce sentences for Protestants and even try and save some of them from death. He tries to petition the queen, say, we can't kill these people left and right. They're not deserving of it, even if we disagree with them. And so he was kind of the moral compass of the queen even. And so when he finds out that Lady Jane is in prison just at, at 15 years old, caught in the middle of all this, he realizes he can't save her life, but maybe he can save her soul by bringing her back to Catholicism. So even though I disagree with this, I don't think being Catholic is the thing that saves you by any means at all. I am not Catholic. So I definitely disagree with John Feckenham here. I really appreciate his heart. And I think that's something we need to do when we look back through history and we see people that did heroic or evil things. It's like there are people who we can respect and love and care about and and admire and emulate in certain parts of who they are without us saying that we approve of every single thing they do. John Feckenham is a hero in my mind, despite the fact that he is against Lady Jane Grey, who is, I guess, more ultimately my hero in this story. And so it doesn't have to be as black and white as, well, I like this person and I hate this side. It's like, no, there's a myriad of things going on here. And though, even though John Feckenham was you know, very staunchly Catholic and very against Lady Jane Grey and very against the idea of Protestantism, He still had a good heart, and he used that heart for good, and I really, really respect that. So whether you're Protestant or Catholic listening to this, I hope that you can see the value and the benefit of of what both of these people did on either side of that aisle in trying to be good people to the best of their ability, to the best that they knew how. So this John Feckenham, he goes in to speak with Lady Jane Grey. Some sources say it was four, three, or two days before she was to die, and they have a series of debates. These debates were actually recorded, and you can find them online right now. These are very public documents, and they are beautiful. It shows a a growing relationship and respect between these two people on opposite ends of the spectrum of belief. But you also see this this 15-year-old against this, this older and incredibly wise Catholic priest, and she really does a fantastic job. For example, in these debates, John Feckenham asks, how many sacraments are there? And Jane replied, two, the one, the sacrament of the baptism, and the other, the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. When Feckenham said, no, there be seven sacraments, she replied again, by what scripture find you that? And so she's appealing to something greater than church tradition or church teaching. She's appealing to the Bible. 
And this to me is something that is just unbelievable for a 15 year old. If I could have done that at 15, wow, where would I be right now? Um, now, unfortunately she was in a really precarious predicament because she was already going to die. And so what would it hurt her to just either give no answer or give the answer they want? Potentially, maybe, the, I mean, the queen's been swayed before, maybe she can save herself. And this, I, I believe this is what John Feckenham thought as well. Maybe she can save herself if she can convert to Catholicism. And yet this is not at all her aspiration. She is holding fast to biblical truth stronger than I could right now, stronger than a lot of people could right now. And she's just 15 years old. She's, a, she's applying her arguments directly from scripture and kind of, um, promoting the authority of scripture in what she says. Now, John Feckenham, unfortunately, replies, we'll talk about that hereafter. So he has no interest in going to the Bible and talking with her about that. He sees this as the church has said so. This is our tradition. This is what the church fathers did and said. So this is what we do. Now, personally, I'm not for that. But again, I respect his strength of will to stand with what he believed to be true. They both had faith in something. It's just that I believe that John Feckenham had faith in the church as access to God, and Lady Jane had faith in the Bible as the word of God. Now, I lean in, in the direction of Lady Jane Grey, absolutely, but I respect the faith and the, the intent of both. I think they're both respectable people. And there was a respect that was formed here. Even though they left the debates and the last words between them, John Feckenham said, I'm afraid we will not meet again. And Lady Jane said, I'm afraid that unless God turns your heart, you're right, we won't meet again. And so he's saying, you're going to die and you're going to go to hell. This is a last ditch effort. Please turn your ways back to the Catholic Church. And she says, no, 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 no. You're going to die and you're going to go to hell. Please turn back to God or allow him to turn him turn you back to him. And so again, it's like one is promoting uh, the church and one is promoting uh, scripture or direct relationship with God. And so this is their final words. And you would think that means they're ending on a bitter note, but that's not the case at all. John Feckenham actually asked to be at her execution, which that sounds like a horrible thing, like he just wanted to witness her death. But no, the people at your execution were those closest to you. And Lady Jane had essentially nobody left. And so for John Feckenham to ask to be at this, it was a very intimate thing. It showed a respect that he had for her, even though she was about to die for beliefs directly contrary to his. Wow, if that isn't lost in the modern world, can we respect people that have beliefs directly contrary to ours? That is a, it's a lost art, but clearly these two had it. And so before she died, she went to John Feckenham. She kissed him on the cheek and she said, I forgive you. She went to the executioner. She kissed him on the cheek and said, I forgive you. She knelt at the block. She tied a, a um, blindfold around her eyes and everyone there said she acted with such poise that they weren't even sure she was about to be executed because she just seemed so at peace with what was happening. She knelt down and she recited Psalm 51. And John Feckenham, moved by this show of, of faith, also recited Psalm 51, but in Latin. And so they're sitting there both reciting this psalm, and I cannot imagine there's a dry eye in the entire room. There was only very few people there. But then in her last moment, she knelt down and she searched for the block. She had a little bit of panic and she said, where should I go? What should I do? She couldn't find the block in front of her that she was supposed to, you know, be executed at. And someone reached out, guided her hands to the block. And she said, Lord, into your hands, I commit my spirit. And she died. Now it ends so horribly sad, but what an incredible sense of peace this woman had at the end to be able to recite this psalm in front of all these people that are there to watch her die. And it's a psalm, not one of rejoicing over your enemies. It was a psalm of asking for forgiveness from God, of repentance for sin. Now, in my mind, Lady Jane Grey is one of the most innocent people ever. She's the picture of youth and innocence. She's 15 years old, or rather she's 16 when she died, but she's just so young and stood so strong for her faith. What could she have to repent of? And yet she didn't look at herself as some hero or some model of faith. She looked at herself as a sinner. And John Feckenham, their party to her death, also looks at himself and sees a sinner and recites the same psalm. I think there's such a beauty in that. And so even though she died, 
Her story is one that inspires my faith day to day. Now, again, I don't agree with everything she believed theologically. I definitely don't agree with everything that John Feckenham believed theologically, but I have such a respect for these two people, their earnestness, their, their strength in what they believed. And I think that I just, I wish we could find more of that in the modern world where we are going to disagree with people left and right. Even in your own circles, we're going to disagree. But where can you look and find something that you respect about a person? Where can you look in that person and see the image of God? Even though it might be misguided, misdirected, covered up a little bit in ways that it shouldn't be, where can you look for that in people and find the beauty that he imbued into them? Where can you find something you respect about them? And where can you extend care and grace and love to them? I think this is such an important lesson, uh, not only in standing for your faith, but in looking across the aisle and just respecting those you disagree with. And I think if more people could do that, um, yes, it doesn't always end perfectly. I mean, Lady Jane died in this event, but it does end with uh, just the onlookers being radically changed by what they just saw in front of them. And that's what's happened for me all throughout the years of listening to this story. And I hope that you take this and it inspires strength of your faith in your own life and um, an ability to look at those you disagree with, with respect and care as well.